I was hoping to see a few more people in this one. So I thought it's not, not actually GNU set specific. Um, right. I forgot to introduce myself last time. I'm Richard Fett MacDonald. Um, I wrote the Web Services Library, which is still something in development, but it's actually used in production code, so it's uh, reliable for what it does so far. Um, right, let's start with looking at Web Services. If for anyone who doesn't know, <laughs> what are Web Services? Well, naively, they're any web based service. But there's a standard web services definition language, um, which is what you're really talking about when you say web services in any sort of corporate environment. Um, web services definition language is, is an XML language. It's used by large organizations to present APIs to let other people use their various services. We tend to use it for talking to mobile phone operators. WSDL 1.1, the de facto standard, is, as far as I can tell, what everyone uses. Um, WSDL 2.0 is the recommendation, the actual official standard, and is uh, not completely different, but substantially different, with um, different structure. It's not compatible. Do. WSDL provides an abstract service definition for some sort of service you want to offer to other people, generally via an internet connection. Um, it has bindings that map the abstract service definition to concrete data encodings and to specific URLs and protocols that you're going to use. It, it says HTTPS or HTTP TTP or whatever, it says where, whereabouts the service is. Um, the main targeted binding for WSDL is SOAP, um, which means that almost everyone maps the abstract service definitions to SOAP calls. Um, in theory, you can use web forms, there's a mapping for that. You can use XML RPC, you can use any other mechanism you like. Um, I don't know if there's an XML RPC mapping that's standard. Um, yeah, I should say I'm, I'm not claiming to be a great expert on web services. Um, I think you have to be really into standards bodies and <laughs> defining things like that to actually get into it that much. Um, the mapping in web services is done by extensibility elements, which are chunks of XML that sit inside other parts of the XML and say, right, this bit is going to be handled by a particular extensibility mechanism. And all the different libraries and frameworks that support web services tend to support different subsets of the available extensibility elements, so they're all incompatible. Uh, web services as I said, primarily uses SOAP simple object access protocol, which is a latent block. It's one of the most complex protocols I've ever heard of. Um, it's bloated, and you have to have software to make it manageable, really. Um, either that, or you resort to just copying the XML documents and hacking them, substitutions for sections of a template XML document. Um, the main frameworks available are Java and C Sharp. So they're not much fun if you're an object of C coder. And as I say, the different implementations all support different incompatible options. That's largely down to WSDL being designed that way. It's specified to be extensible. Um, so I got into this because at work I had to integrate stuff with corporate web services. I just couldn't find free software solutions to do the job in C or Objective-C. Uh, Java was readily available because there's um, stuff under the name Apache label, I think, really. But using Java from other services is a painful, slow operation. You have to start a virtual machine and run JMI 
importance to it. So we needed the free Objective-C or C solution. Uh, since I can read an Objective-C, I chose Objective-C rather than C. The GNU Step Web Services Library was written for better performance than you can get out of the Java stuff that I was at, looking at. And of course, we target the most common WSDL setups, specifically the ones I needed to use, of course. But the idea is to make it easy to extend and make the framework more versatile, cover more options in one way. So, the library is written in Objective C. It builds with GNU Step Make or Apple Xcode. It's completely portable between the two. In fact, it should run on any system. It implements WSDL 1.1, more or less, which is to say all the common standard bits. It targets the SOAP binding since that's what everyone uses. It can easily be extended to the others because it's designed with the extensibility elements to be extensible. It makes it simple to write clients without having to use Java or C Sharp. So the way it works is to parse WSDL documents to produce a tree of objects which can be then, then be examined or modified. You can also generate WSDL documents from a tree of objects, which leaves us the possibility of actually writing WSDL editors in the future. In order to support that, we have a lightweight XML tree implementation in there. And the main operation that you actually end up doing, hopefully, is telling a GWS service object to perform a particular service, to talk to a service and perform an operation. We also provide an XML RPC coder. That's purely because I think RP XML RPC is a far superior um, protocol to SOAP. So if you can possibly do it, you should. Um, so we've got synchronous and asynchronous operations. There's no WSDL extensibility binding for XML RPC available yet. So it would be nice if someone would contribute that, maybe I'll write one in the future. What that actually means is that you can't take a WSDL document and have it generate the XML RPC code entirely for you. You've got to do a bit of it yourself. <laughs> so um, it's not a big problem. So if you don't need to use WSDL and SOAP, just use the XML RPC. Right, of course we provide SOAP in here. You can use it directly for SOAP requests. You don't have to use it as part of the web services structure. The, um, however, the GWS service understands the SOAP extensibility elements in the WSDL, and that allows you to invoke a service using SOAP with a minimum of effort. You don't have to fill in details to tell it whether it's supposed to be using literal encoding or, um, or, or not, because the WSDL will tell it that for you. Right, so the top of the structure, the tree, is the GWS document. That's initialized from a URL generally, or maybe from a local file. Lab downloads or loads in the file, parses it, and creates an instance of the GWS document. And that provides methods to examine the contents of the document and to modify them so we can edit. It also provides a mechanism to regenerate a WSDL document so you can post out a new version of it. Uh, finally, it provides a registration mechanism for the handlers to deal with WSDL extensibility. Within the document, you have various other objects. At the top level, the GWS document. Inside, you have GWS messages, which encapsulate the XML message element in the WSDL document. <laughs> and we've got 
got the GWS port type, which encapsulates the port type from the XML bindings port service. So these are the major components that appear in a WSDL document unmapped onto objects that we hold in the tree. So the GWS message, which is the XML message, is the abstract idea of passing data between two endpoints. So it just says, here's the server, here's the client, we're passing this data between the two. It can contain documentation, so there's a, an element in there in the XML that can document what that message is supposed to be for, how it's supposed to be used. It will contain a list of named parts, those are the actual data items that go to make up that particular message. The GWS port type represents a port type which is a definition of an endpoint that you might be talking to. So it's the, <coughs> the thing that's sitting on the end of a URL that you're going to connect to. Again, it can provide documentation. It always provides a set of named operations. Those are effectively the procedure calls you can make to that endpoint. Each of those operations can consist of an input message, the data you send to it, an output message, the data that comes back to your client, and perhaps a fault message to indicate that there's some sort of error. Again, that will come back to your client. Ah, GWS binding. Right. Again, each of these bindings has a unique name, so you can re refer to them easily within the document. It can contain documentation, but most people don't. And it contains extensibility rules, which um, basically tell you how to handle something, how, whether you're going to use SOAP or XML RPC or whatever. Each binding references a particular port type, so it's talking about how that port type is handled, how operations sent to that port are handled. And it lists the operations that you already had listed in the port type, but this time, rather than just specifying what the operations are in an abstract way, which is what the port type does, this gives you the extensibility element that tells you how those operations are actually managed. Um, how the data is encoded. So, a port. The concrete example of, an end, of the endpoint. If the port type tells you what kind of endpoint you've got, the port tells you you have a particular port, it's on this particular URL, you can therefore, given the port, send a message to it. Um, if you've got a SOAP extensibility, then in, in the GWS port, then that will tell you that the URL you've got to send to is a particular URL, and it will tell you the SOAP action header to put in the um, HTTP request. And I think almost finally, the GWS service is where all the other information <coughs> actually comes together. So a service represents again the particular service element in the XML document, so you can have multiple services within a single document. Each one has a unique name so you can find the service you want. Uh, again, a service has documentation in the XML, uh, though I've yet to see any real WSTL documents. Um, it has a list of all the ports we've got. So those, the port, if you remember, contained the extensibility that told you the URL you actually had to connect to, stuff like that, as well as referencing the abstract binding information that told you about the port type that is used. It's all a huge chain of information that could be represented much more compactly probably. 
that's the makeup of the SEO um, So we, the service lists all the ports that it can use, and the GWS service object handles invoking an operation on the service. Um, that's actually making a real concrete call to a real server at the other end <laughs> and getting the data back. So that's what you really need to use. And you can use it without a GWS document. Normally, or let's say normally, <laughs> hopefully, you parse a WSDL object into a GWS document which con creates all those other objects I've talked about behind the scenes. And you look at that GWS document for a particular service by name. Given that service object, you start invoking operations. GWS element, another lightweight class, a small API, represents an XML element but omits anything that you don't actually need for supporting web services. Uh, it's used throughout the library and lets us parse trees and unparse trees to serialize and deserialize information. It's an intermediate stage when we're encoding SOAP requests. Generally, you probably don't need to touch it. That's, that's the list of the main classes. Right. So we've got two important groups left. The extensibility elements and the coders. They don't map directly to anything in XML. Um, the GWS extensibility is not a mapping from one of the XML extensibility elements. Um, it's actually an object that handles dealing with an extensibility element. So you might have, you do have a GWS SOAP extensibility that provides for handling of SOAP extensibility elements, understands what they mean basically and adjust the way we deal with data. <coughs> Similarly, the GWS coder in its subclasses handle the encoding and decoding of the data. So they, they don't correspond to anything directly in the document, but they will convert from property list format, which is the way... Um, go back on that, actually. I won't say property list format, I'll say a structure of linked objects, a dictionary containing various other objects that describe the parameters you want to pass across to a remote service. Um, they're, the, they're the native internal Objective-C representation of your parameters and service results. So the coder takes those and it converts them into uh, a SOAP request. Extensibility objects. The way extensibility works is that each extensibility object in the XML of the WSDL document has a namespace associated with it. So what you do is you register a handler for that particular namespace. And when a document is passed, the handler for the namespace receives calls, callbacks from the um, GWSDL document telling it about the, names, the extensibility items it's parsing. And the handler can then check that those items make sense, check that it understands them. Um, if it's got an extensibility item that it has to understand, and yet it doesn't, it can raise an exception. Um, when a message is sent out by a service, we call the handler again for each of the extensibility elements defined for that service. And in that case, the handler doesn't merely validate the XML and check that it understands it. It also takes actions on the basis of that. <coughs> so it would say, we know that the parameters actually have to be passed in a certain order. We'll define that order for the coder to pass. Um, we know that their sense is literal rather than used. Yeah, different different op opera options for the so it will set in the code. So obviously implementing that kind of thing is fairly complex, but we have an example in that we have a concrete soap code, a soap extensibility. Right, the coders themselves. 
encode property lists as to NS data objects, or decode an NS data to a property list. I, when I wrote that, I was assuming, I guess, uh, a GNU step or Apple audience. So I, I think I may explain a little more in case the people here are not familiar with either. Um, the term property list in Coco and in GNU step is used to describe quite complex data structures consisting of collections, arrays, and dictionaries, and strings, <coughs> numbers, dates, booleans. We have a complex network of these objects as a property list. So a coder takes this complex network of objects, well, actually it's usually a fairly simple network of objects, because it's generally just a a list of parameters and maybe they have some structure, but it serializes them. It's a semi-abstract class, which means it does some things, but it doesn't do everything that's actually declared in its API. So it has convenience methods for handling XML, encoding, decoding, using GWS elements, so it can handle the serialization and deserialization for an XML document. But it also has other methods for handling the delegation of encoding of specific items. And it has, as I said, the methods for decoding and encoding property lists, which are actually handled by a subclass. Ah, I did put that there. Okay, so a message is a dictionary, generally speaking. We add extra keys in our property list in, in that dictionary uh, to tell the coder how to encode the data. So we have a, a method key which specifies the method name that we're trying to invoke. The parameters key gives you a dictionary with the parameters. The order key tells you what order those parameters have to be sent in. An error key in a response coming back tells you what, what the problem was. So, the XML RPC encoder will, is a subclass of the coder, and it will take a property list and create, create an XML RPC request or a response. Similarly, it will decode any XML RPC document to a property list. Um, that will actually handle any valid XML RPC request because XML RPC is nice and simple. Um, it supports setting the time zone for encoding and decoding the date and time steps because that's about the only thing XML RPC doesn't really cover. It defines a format for date, it doesn't specify the time zone, so that has to be agreed between the two endpoints of the service. The SOAP coder adds yet more keys because SOAP is a whole lot more complex. Um, Right, so there's the body encoding style, which can be RPC or document or wrapped. Um, if you're not familiar with SOAP, that's really telling you something about the general structure of the SOAP request. That you've got um, a layout in your XML with, if it's a document format, everything's kind of near the top level of the XML. If it's an RPC format, then you've got um, an XML element to say what the method name is and all the parameters in another XML element a bit further down. Um, so it's something you generally don't want to bother with. And, um, hopefully, uh, that, that information will come from the WSDL document. So you can set it manually using that key or the WSDL document can fill it in for you. Similarly, the use keys, encoded or literal, tells you something about the way that um, data is encoded in the XML. Um, essentially, if I remember the right way around, encoded means that every element you pass along has to have type information with it. And literal means you pass the element with the data and the other end works out what type it's supposed to be. Um, the message header key 
lets you add <coughs> header information, which is another thing that SOAP adds. Um, the namespace URI and the namespace name key that you assign the URI and the namespace name to your SOAP. And the um, SOAP value key is actually a special case that's not part of the SOAP stuff so much as it lets you define a dictionary that has extra information in it for giving you yet more control over how the SOAP stuff is intended. Yeah. I think it's pretty clear that trying to settle that manually for each SOAP request is tedious. If you have a WSDL document, it handles it all. So when you invoke the operation, the service object calls the extensibility handler and that fills in all those values based on the extensibility information in the XML of the document. It'll even create the code for you. So. Delegation. We use that a reasonable amount in this. It's a common common practice in um, open step APIs. So the delegate of a coder is an object that handles <coughs> certain operations for it, or always informed of certain operations when they happen. So normally we have a service as the delegate of a coder. If you want to, you can put your own delegate in there between the service and the coder and intercept the messages coming from the coder to the service. If you intercept those messages, you can override the encoding or decoding of any data item you like. So you've got very fine control over what actually gets sent out to the other end. You can implement custom coding and encoding to deal with bugs or unusual features in a service that you're talking to. Right, the service delegates. Um, normally a service has no delegate and you can set up your own delegate for a service. Um, so you can be notified when it's completed an RPC process, sent something to the other end, it's received something back. You can be notified when it's about to send something to the other end and you can take the data that it's about to send and completely replace it with something else. Similarly, when a response comes back, you can take the raw data coming from the other end, parse it your own way with something that's optimized for parsing a particular service if you want. <coughs> the cert bindings contain the URL to be used for an operation. That's in the extensibility of the port, if I remember correctly. Often the URL is gone. I'm <laughs> I, I, almost always the URL is wrong. And that tends to be, I think, because what happens is you're, you've got a big organisation, they develop this, they set the URL that they're doing their web service on, and then they expose this nice new web service to the rest of the world through a firewall that's using NAT to change the IP address. You know. So the URL is then wrong. Um, so you have to override it quite often. You can do that by setting a delegate for the service. And at the moment when it's about to send the request to the other end, you tell it to use a different URL. So it's quite straightforward. You can change the same action header in the HTTP request at the same time if you want. Debugging. Well, you're going to have to do that. Um, you can set on turn debugging on globally for the web services <coughs> just by turning on a user default. And that will do a fair bit of logging and also generate extra information. Um, you can also use a method on the service to turn on um, debugging for that service, which will record all the XML sent and received. Um, so you can look and see exactly what went out and try and figure out why the other end didn't like it. Um, and that will also turn on debugging in the code as that service uses. Um, you can also set it at the specific coder level if you just want to 
turn on or off logging to that code. Optimization, that's a big issue because uh, using web services tends to be very slow. Um, this was really designed to try and make it faster, mostly because uh, the main use I've had for it is sending SMS messages to mobile phones, which occasionally needs you to send out tens or possibly even hundreds of messages a second. I don't, you don't get hundreds of messages a second through a typical web service API, no matter what you did, but you can get tens, tens of messages a second. So the code delegate methods let you override the encoding and decoding of individual items. That means that if you know that most of the items that you're going to be sending as part of your service request are actually fit to constants, what you can do is capture them the first time they're generated and just reset the same ones again and again so that you save the software the effort of having to generate those items. Similarly, the service delegate methods let you override the encoding and decoding of the entire request. Now, probably you don't want to do that, but on the odd occasion when um, performance really is the issue, you can do that. Again, you have the advantage that what the system will do is the first time round it will produce the XML that you need to send, and you can then use that as a template for new versions of the XML when you send the next message. Um, the GWS element class has a, a strange method called set literal value, which allows you to basically set a string value for that element and that, uh, that string will be used literally in the serialized XML resulting from it. Uh, again, that's a mechanism of stopping you having to generate the text in the document. You can just plug that in directly. Uh, has to be used with caution, obviously, because if you set a literal value, then it doesn't necessarily um, represent valid XML. Uh, and the other thing that you can do is use a standalone service instance to avoid checking the WSDL. So in that case you do have to fill in <coughs> all those properties yourselves, yourself. Um, but it can avoid more overheads. So what we've given you is something that lets you write web service clients in Objective-C. Um, it should let you write servers in Objective-C as well if you want, but that's largely untested because that's not what I use. Uh, your code will run on Coco, it will run with new step on Linux, BSD, Windows, and you can actually keep it simple by ignoring almost everything I've talked about. <laughs> Probably a good idea if possible. <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> so, um, Ricardo is going to give you a concrete example of um, an application using using your web fabulous website. <laughs> So what are we going to see now? It's, a, it's an example usage of these web services. So concretely, we access salespost.com, which is a major, it's a major on-demand CRM solution. It's the market leader, essentially. It's, simple. it's not open source, it's closed source. But, uh, it's commercially used and very widespread. 
What does it mean? It's on demand. It means it's they call it software as a service. So you don't install anything. You get your browser login and walk from everywhere. <coughs> How do you access the data inside? So if you have a CM solution, you need to integrate with legacy application with other systems because you need to essentially import and export data. The easiest case is if you use the CIM for personal usage, you have another book. Of course, it gets much more complex because companies may have to track orders, uh, opportunities, leads, uh, up to tickets, cases, customer support, so it can be tons of data, but let's think about contacts because it is easy. It's not, it's not others. Since the application does not reside in your data center, you don't have access to the database. So the only way you can get data in or out, Salesforce, or competing solution, everything which is on demand essentially follows the same philosophy, is you need to pass through their mechanism. So they can give you tools, and, they and if these tools don't fit you, you need to access the database using APIs. These APIs are exposed as web services, and here we have the connection. What's the problem? Salesforce.com supplies you with tools, for example, for loading your contact list, or exporting, updating, doing everything with your data. But these are for Windows. So you have a tool, but for example, you can take a flat file, or CSV file, or XML file, and just pump it up and load all your orders in quick time, or you can update them, delete them. <coughs> if you need something more customized, they provide you with a library for Java, or I wrote C-sharp, actually it's .NET, so the majority of .NET users use C-sharp. So with those libraries, you can write custom applications, you can do, for example, web service, or other third-party vendors did make big integration tools. <coughs> For Objective-C, no libraries of them supply. <coughs> I wonder, if I think if I call the customer service at Salesforce and tell you I have Objective-C, I probably don't even know what it is. The web services are explored, follow the SOAP standard, so it's a complex, verbose, and difficult thing which I've explained. And the application, we think about, I have called it data basin, because you wash your hands with soap and you wash your data with soap, exploits a GNU step web asset to encode soap requests and decode responses, because at the end, you speak to Salesforce with requests and they give you responses. This is the most short, short summary I can give you. The request will be. Mm, familiar to anybody of you who is a database person. So essentially, you are doing queries, insert, delete, updates. There are other requests, which are service requests, so they actually invoke operations in the application. So they are not just accessing table data, but for example, you can do a login, which is the only non-database request I listed here which is very important. And there is an, a special database request, which is the upsert, which is essentially an update insert. So what you typically need to do in a <coughs> system integration is you have a bunch of orders with a unique ID, and you pump them up in your system. And you don't want to care if they exist or not. Usually, what you need to do is first to do an insert and then check what didn't get in and do an update, or the other way, you do an update. What didn't update, you get an error file, and then you do an insert of what didn't get in. This is the standard way, and recently, Salesforce implemented this upset method. I just put it in here as a note. So what's the database in, in short? It's an application, free, open source, hosted in the GNUSTEP application project, and the goal is to provide a dot data loader replacement for the GNUSTEP environment to bring in such a tool many into Unix, which is the simple tool Salesforce provides for Windows. I think 
why can't I have it on my Linux machine? Uh, the last sentence is I need a other more like a password for the API interaction class, mm -hmm. which is what I'm writing. So I'm writing a class which can talk to Salesforce having an input, which can then be reused. So that allows that I'm with you because essentially it's a static tool if you want to have an integration application or you need to have a custom application, you can use this class. Essentially, I'm going to write what Salesforce usually provides you for other languages. Here I schematize the system where you, how you talk to Salesforce. This is Salesforce. You send a request. The request is for me a dictionary, so it can play some data. It gets encoded by the web services into a soft message. And then you get the response, the response gets decoded, and you have an array with the data. So ideally here you have an array with all your names and phone numbers. This is plainly set. Unfortunately, things are not so easy because to a web service is a new URL everybody can query. So you need security. And everybody has its own manner to make security. In the case of Salesforce, the wall login process is done in a complicated way. I will explain it just because it means it's an example of what currently is implemented. You have a URL, you make a request, the login request, and this is a common URL. So everybody in the world will query that precise URL. Even if Salesforce has like 20 data centers in the world, Everywhere you call this URL and you make a login where essentially you, are, you have your credentials, username, password, and a security token. Because if you are within an organization, your username and password are enough. If you are outside, which is typically the case because you want to have a system on demand because you are abroad with your laptop, you have a GPRS connection, UMTS connection, or you are a customer connecting, you either need to free up your IP, saying this uh, trusted IP, or you insert a token, which is a Salesforce generated token, which identifies you uniquely, and it gets reset for each password change, and it essentially acts as an additional password, which means that your client is trusted. Once you send these three identifying elements, Salesforce to essentially get back a session ID, which means, like in most web applications, you have an ID for your session for that particular IP, which is valid for a certain amount of time. What is not written here is that you get also back a new add point. This new add point is where you, all your further requests will go. And this is different each time query because for uh, load balance, balancing, out system outages, for every reason, you, each time you get one different, and this is what, for example, discussed, not always this URL is correct. For example, one bike I discovered is that if you do an H, you can do the whole process either using HTTP or secure HTTP. Both are possible, of course, secure connection is fair because maybe you are sensing sensitive data, but what are possible. So you can query the first login, the first then you can do it on the secure or on the non-secure URL. The problem is that you should get a, rest, uh, a new URL which is consistent with what you sent the first time. The fact is that you always get a secure one. So if you don't support HTTPS, essentially you're not going to send any data back. So you need to rewrite the URL. That's an example of <coughs> Then you have the session ID you keep for all subsequent requests you're going to do. In this case, the example is just a query. So I'm going to get some records and I pass a request. In this case, it's just something which is SQL. They call it SQL. It's an SQL. Select from table. And you pass a session ID, which identifies you from that point on. And say so, give you back a response. The records you query, and 
uh, have some caveats because uh, well, you get an array with types, column names, you need to count that with these methods. And there is also a limitation because you could query 10,000 uh, objects and you will always get 255 records. So this is for the record. Theoretically, if you want to get more records, there is a special query more. It is like a query which continues where the previous query left behind. I did not implement this yet. So this is, in short, what we said. We sent the username and password and token, receive a valid session ID. You send back the SQL-like statement, the session ID, and you receive a record array. Then you have something in memory, and for the moment I write it to the CSV file because that's industry standard because we, everybody has XML, which is too verbose. That files are crap, even if a lot of system management likes it. Then, so my experience is that CSV is a good compromise between performance. This is an example. I want to try to connect right now, even if we put the connection is we might try if we have time. So here we see databasing. The projector is to this quality. Here you see the login panel, and here you see you just enter your query, select the output file, and execute. So the interface is quite crude at the moment because the important things are underneath. And here we see just the CSV file open by OpenOffice. <coughs> and we say we get back the column name, the type, and the ID will just get this blank because they did not request it, but you always get it back. Quite easy and simple. But the future for databasing, well, first I just implemented login and query because that was hard enough at the point because uh, I did not use the WSDL parsing, but I called it all by hand with his head. But it wasn't finished. <laughs> it, it wasn't finished because when I started this, uh, the, uh, the web services did not support SOAP yet. He coded it. Each time I needed a new feature, he had implemented it. And I think we got a neat result because actually what we have here is a demonstration that the world system works because other queries are not more complicated than login and query. So the rest is just long work of typing and coding, but my main work is done. Then other features which the application itself needs is a better file input and output, CSV, reading and writing, XML, flat files, escaping, Unicode <coughs> characters, because whatever you have in your database. I can speak of experience because I use several of these commercial tools and each one has its own bugs and quilts. What I request from the GNUSTEP web services is that at the moment the performance is suboptimal because first if you do a lot of queries you can say I keep the con your app connection open and just continue to query. At the moment we close and open and so this is for pipeline connections and this is more important for you. For me, which I, I have a, another problem. Yes, I, have I actually have that in GNU step, but not in Coke. <coughs> <Yeah. So laughs> you need to figure out how to open. If you have few queries, which is what you usually do with that integration, but have a lot of data, the problem is data compression. You can essentially zip up your verbose XML request because SOAP ends up being very, very verbose because you have all the type information, all the space information. Each value is encoded and has a type information attached to it. And there are all the tags around it. So you end up for sending 10 kilobytes, you maybe even send twice that amount of data needed, all in plain ASCII text. So sales for support and some web service framework support data compression. I can admit I, I use professional and expensive tools and they don't support it. But the official sales for tools support it and the performance improvement is really, really good. Especially with pattern data like contacts where everybody you have phone number with different government files. So essentially that's it. We don't have more. I could try 
to NAS application and see if we have network. Let's see, this is an instance of Salesforce CMM. If somebody wants to test this application, Salesforce gives you out a free developer environment, which has other features. The only thing it limits you in the data of like 10 megabytes. So you can develop test everything, but of course you can use it for your enterprise. The application is proven on on uh, new step and thanks to the latest efforts it already runs under Windows. So this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now I show somewhere if you have my credentials, if not have them. Everybody has seen my password, so I need to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> We did not see the debug that was, which I assure is very, very, very good. In the background, we had like two kilobytes of debugging information, which is very useful because there is a lot of debugging. And then we can actually do a query. <coughs> For example, so, once everything was, was done, the concept is pretty simple. The fact is that between the specification of the WSPI document and what you actually need, the button, is pretty much it's short because there's, there is no rocket science behind it. The problem is that, for example, we discovered that the many XML decoders on the server end are very sensitive, so they are order sensitive. You send your password and your, your username, or your username and your password, one works, the other one not. This makes no sense for XML, but we discovered it, and you need, for example, to implement all the order coding just to get the parameters in the correct order. And there are many other quirks like actions needing to be set to empty string instead of nil, which just it's just debugging. So it's not all fault. Yes. That's it. If anybody has questions. The, w the WSDL document is supposed to tell you all those things and usually it's right. And we now have the code to parse it and, and actually fill that all in, which takes out all the effort of um, having to remember it and read it yourself and add it in yourself. I don't have the WSDL document here because I wanted to show. <coughs> the document is, uh, is really, really big, so it contains uh, specification not for every <coughs> period, but every response and for, for every record it needs to specify the type. So it essentially it covers up everything. Does it have any documentation? Yes, you need to guess. <laughs> 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 we went to, to get the login walk because login is the most difficult part because you have no interaction with the system. Because afterwards you can get an error. So I just ended up sniffing the HTTP connection and, and I commercial tool did and tried to make it the same. <laughs> So the, the WSDL documents for each element pretty much contain the documentation element that is supposed to make WSDL self-documenting, which will tell you how, how you're supposed to use the service. 
the sales force one doesn't have any documentation. No, no other WSDL that I've used has any documentation to still So, yeah, it depends upon human beings to put that into the WSDL. In reality, people don't generally. Okay. I tried to load the XML document, but the connection is already in the opening thing. So, questions? The project is free, available, and it may be a good starting point to actually use. Good. I think we're done. What's the next?